IS systems people, because they're a bunch of naive realists. And uh, I, I don't <laughs> like that. I mean, reality doesn't have much to do with anything. It's all a matter of epistemology as far as I'm concerned. So actually, I probably should be much more a member of the cybernetics group because it's an epistemological as opposed to an ontological group. So I'm happy to be here. My co-author is, um, is from uh, Mario Giampietro's lab. Um, Mario is totally brilliant, wonderful stuff in Barcelona. Uh, you, and uh, his students are spectacular. This is Dr. Kovacek now. Uh, she has... Um, She's graduated some years ago. Uh, she and I published papers together. Uh, uh, you can do this, which is, if, if a journal is asking you to review, you're doing them a favor. You don't actually have to go through their website. And I announce that uh, all the time, saying, um, I'm doing you a favor. You will send me the manuscript in Word or PDF. I will write my review and send it back to a real person, not some website that's been possible to work. Uh, and so Zora, bless her, is when I'm actually submitting a paper and they're, not, they're doing me a paper, somebody has to deal with the websites and things like that. And Zora, bless her, does that. She's also an intellectual equal and colleague. Um, but uh, we publish several papers together. Um, I'm going to talk about complexity and assert at the start that complexity is necessary when there is more than one level of analysis required. This is, a, this is something I got from Robert Rosen. We all got so much from Robert Rosen. Uh, so this whole talk is about how levels of organization pertain to complexity, and it's actually a very good way of dealing with stubborn people who don't like the notion of complexity. Uh, I'm an ecologist, they're all a bunch of naive realists there, uh, and it's, um, it's difficult to get them to abstract, really. So they're all saying complexity is a real thing. Um, no, no, complexity is about the way you look at the system. Um, the example that they would like to use is the brain is complex. Well, if you think of it in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, uh, neurons and, and, and such. This thing work? Well, apparently not. Oh, maybe this works. Oh, don't worry. Um, they think that the brain is a good example of a concept of a complex system. It has to be complex. And the answer is, well, no, it doesn't. That is to say, it depends upon the question you ask. So if you're asking not about how does cognition relate to the brain through neurons, which I think is a complex issue. Um, if you ask another question, which is, how did the mammalian brain come from the reptilian brain? It's actually simple. There are three parts, the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain, and the forebrain gets bigger. Three parts, one trend. That's simple, guys. Um, the difficulty is that my guys, at least, are a bunch of naive realists. Yes, but it's really complex. I don't know what that could mean, let alone what that does mean. Uh, so we're not talking about um, a, a material system here. So complexity requires more than one level of analysis for adequate description. This is very much a postmodern notion. And I don't, we all variously come from orthodox disciplines. My guys are ferociously hostile to postmodernism. Uh, they're very distinctly modernists. And the crowd that you have to deal with in your disciplines will almost certainly be the same way. Uh, this is Silvio Funderwitz's work with, uh, with Jerry Rivets. And in a lovely paper in 1992 called The Good, the True, and the Postmodern, he identifies that in classical times, there was an external reference, and the external reference was what everybody thinks. Um, basically, you would say, yes, I like that Titian. Uh, everyone knows T Titian is a great painter. Uh, I, if, if I were you or your highness, I'd buy another one. <laughs> uh, and, so, <laughs> and so, in a classical world, 
the original isn't really quite the original. I mean, they basically say, oh, I mean, there's a cherub up in that corner. Would you paint that in and make sure he's smiling? Um, and actually, at Leonardo's angel on the far edge there, uh, it's the best figure in the whole painting, and uh, everything else pales with Leonardo, who was a student at the time. So the original isn't really done by Titian. Titian sort of gets it all done by his apprentices and then touches it up at the end, and it's a Titian. This is not to be confused with a modern world, which also has an external reference. But the external reference isn't what everybody thinks. It's closer to reality. In a modernist world, a system is of higher quality the closer it is to reality. Uh, Picasso would be a fine example of modern art, but modern science works the same way. Um, it is because of a reference to reality that Picasso has noses going one way and eyes turning another. Um, it's all distorted. And the reason is he's looking at the system full face, three-quarter face, and profile all at the same time. Because the real face can be looked at in all of those ways. So if you want to get closer to the reality of the situation, you have to get a distortion. So realists uh, want it to be real, and they are prepared to do anything to distort the scheme so that it can appear to be real. Um, so um, realist scientists, basically when the machine goes ping, we're close to reality. And we just have to believe that. They'll be intolerant of you if you, if you say anything else. Um, they're very hostile to, uh, the, to, to a postmodern view. Postmodernity doesn't have an external view, it has an internal view. It's internal to the process. Um, you have high quality research uh, involving careful details, lab notebooks, and things like that. Um, and you're, um, you also have dynamical quality, which, in, which is peer review and representing new lines of investigation and so forth. So one doesn't have to have external reality being reflected. And so a postmodern view is powerful and very different, but it's treated in a very hostile way by normal scientists. Almost all scientists, normal scientists, are going to be reductionist mechanist realists. Um, that's inappropriate when dealing with issues of complexity. It's very easy to get levels of analysis confused. Happens all the time. Here is a wonderful example. Uh, she just finished her first college class now, so this picture is some, some years ago, a decade or so. And I said to my daughter, Gwyneth, I said, your socks are on the wrong feet. A classic response of the wrong level of analysis, they're my feet. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yes, it's true. What she said it's true. They are dealer, but it's beside the point because it's an inappropriate level of analysis. So level of analysis and lots of them are critical to the discourse. <clears throat> uh, I published a paper in 1984, which has become affectionately called the Eyes Paper. And you'll see why soon, because there are pictures of eyes looking. So if we take a system, and if we wanted to find out from God exactly what the situation really was in fully ontological truth, that's it up there. Uh, but the trouble is, you don't see, you, all you see is the thing itself. You don't see its context, and you don't see its parts. Alternatively, you can see the context, in which case you know that the thing is part of a pair of things. Um, and that casts things very differently. Alternatively, you can move in closer, whereupon the whole disappears and you're dealing with the parts. Uh, sometimes you can look at the environment, so instead of looking in, you look out. So what's the environment like inside the entity, as opposed to uh, what is the environment of the entity itself. And all of these represent different levels of analysis. And that's what complicates and makes uh, complexity such a difficult issue. Um, 
Complexity requires more than one level of analysis. There are lots of ways of having more than one level of analysis. Sometimes it's large scale versus small. Sometimes it's a view from inside versus outside. Sometimes it's a short term versus a long term <coughs> view. But those are just three examples of the way in which a system can be viewed at several levels of analysis. The trouble with multiple levels is they don't fit. They don't map onto one another. They will have different grains, that's the bits, the, the, what you assert to be parts will be bigger or smaller depending upon the grain that you use to look at the system. It's not that there really is a particular grain, it's something that you choose as you look and address it. So the grain will be different between different levels of analysis, and so the bits won't fit together, and that'll confuse the situation. Also, the extent of the discourse is going to be different at different levels of analysis, and as a result, the different levels are addressing different universes, and the two observations won't fit one onto another. So different levels of analysis raise all sorts of difficulties. So normal scientists complain, how can there be complexity? They don't like complexity. How can there be complexity when there's no unified definition about it? Well, the reason is, it's not until definitions fail that you're dealing with complexity. And that upsets uh, naive realists as well. Um, there is no agreed upon definition because um, it isn't complex until there is contradiction and conflict. Complexity cannot be unified. It's always contradictory because there are always at least two levels of analysis involved. Remember in my first slide, there are five or six levels of analysis involved with the brain and neurons and thinking. So I'm going to go through a series of examples of systems which are complex and the manner in which that complexity comes from the fact that we're dealing with more than one level of analysis. First example I'll use is Arthur Kessler's Holon. Uh, then a classic example of complexity is chaos theory. I might point out that chaos theory isn't a lot about complexity and not really very interestingly about complexity, but it does represent an absolutely minimal standard for what a complex system would be. I'll then talk about Jevons' paradox um, and then Rosen on similarity versus similitude. In the end, we'll talk about Euclidean versus non-Euclidean spaces and how the difference between them is really a difference between levels of analysis. So the difference between Einstein and Newton is simply a different level of analysis. So here is Arthur Kessler's Holon. Um, it's quite a simple notion. What it questions is, how can a system be on the one hand an autonomous whole, but on the other hand, at a higher level of analysis, be part of uh, a larger system? So how can it be an autonomous whole on the one hand, but an autonomous system on the other? And that leads to all sorts of difficulties and conflict. Uh, in, and conflict. A classic example here is the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We're talking here about emergence, and the way that you put the parts together, and out of that comes some sort of an emergence. Wetness of water, for example, is a difficulty. Because wetness of water is an undeniable thing. You're confident about it. On the other hand, you can't get a series, a, 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 an atomic set of forceps and go in there and pull out a wet one. <laughs> um, water molecules are not wet or otherwise. Wetness is a discourse at a higher level of analysis. Uh, the other one, uh, the other conflict, which is equally applied but is less, so, less well known, which is the sum of the parts is also greater than the whole. That is to say, there are things that the parts can do when they're outside the whole, that they can't do when they're inside the whole. For example, populations of organisms can grow faster if they're outside the community that normally would constrain them. So, um, in a simple system, the parts equal the whole, there is no inconsistency. And that's the world in which my ecological colleagues like to work. Complexity in chaos. 
Um, chaotic equations, we knew about chaotic equations, the Julia set, for example, uh, in the late 19th century. We knew they were nasty, perverse systems. We just didn't know how to handle them. It wasn't until um, the coming of, uh, of fractal analysis and Robert May's work where he kept on bumping up the growth rate of equations so that the growth and the lag were out of step and eventually the system entered uh, chaos. Uh, the conflict which occurs there is with this infinitely sensitive initial conditions, you can't actually set up a chaotic equation to run the same twice. Well, you can arbitrarily get a set of significant digits and then arbitrarily say everything is zero after that. At that point, you could repeat it. But if you're making a measurement, you can't measure the initial conditions accurately enough so that when you run it twice, it turns out the same. After a thousand or so iterations, uh, you find none of the systems difficult, different. If, for example, you use single precision versus double precision uh, in computers um, in a chaotic equation, you're going to get different results because of that incredible sensitivity, the infinite sensitivity to initial conditions. Um, so we have short equations, which uh, chaotic equations are quite impressively short, some of them, some of them are long, but many of them are very short indeed. And yet they have these infinitely rich patterns of output. So how can something small and crisp generate a pattern of uh, basically infinite complicated, complicatedness? How can that happen? The reason is that we, in chaotic equations, you have to take zero and infinity seriously. And the trouble with those numbers is they're undefined. So you're using as part of your definition a situation that cannot be defined. That's going to uh, cause you all sorts of problems. So we look at chaotic systems in terms of strange attractors. Ordinary attractors would be a pendulum moving back and forth, which if you plotted uh, velocity against place, uh, they would uh, go in a circle if there's no friction or spiral down till the pendulum is hanging uh, there in the middle. Uh, but in chaos, you don't have attractors attracting to a stable point. You have strange attractors. And the trouble with strange attractors is they never settle down. Whereas mo a lot of equations will go to an equilibrium point of some sort. It doesn't matter where you start, you'll end up at that equilibrium point. Every time you start off with a different starting point in a chaotic equation, the results will turn out to be significantly different. They ne in chaotic equations, they never repeat. Um, you see a track here, which indicates the strange attractor. But if you go in closer and closer and closer, you find that they are infinitely dense. Every time you go around, the next track around is, uh, is minutely different. Um, and in this way, then, uh, chaotic strange attractors never settle down, the path never repeats. While the strange attractor limits the range of the attractor, um, the density of the track is essentially infinite. These things are very abstract and arbitrary notion. When would you ever talk about that sort of thing? When I was first uh, learning biology, there were simple systems and you worked on them, and there were complex systems and you didn't work on them because you couldn't do anything about it. But you actually don't have to give up these days. Just because a system shows an infinitely rich pattern, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean uh, that, um, uh, that, uh, uh, it, that there's not uh, a valid way to look at it several different ways. Uh, an example here would be, um, I'm not much of a naturalist. For an ecologist and a quantitative ecologist, I'm not much of a mathematician. And I'm actually a lousy uh, field biologist. But even I can tell an oak tree from an elm tree every time I'm presented with the distinction. You may not be able to, but us professionals actually can do that. The critical thing is that no two elm trees have ever been identical. I mean, every time you start to grow, there's a, a, a branch in a different place. It's a bit bigger, a bit smaller, in no time at all. You're dealing with a distinctive, particular elm tree. And so we have an infinite variety of different elms. On the other hand, despite the fact that there's an infinite variety of elms available, 
They never turn into an oak tree. <laughs> and the reason is the oak tree is on a different strange tractor. So these notions actually did apply before, we just didn't properly understand them. We didn't have the intellectual devices for dealing with that. So there's the elm, there's the oak. You're not going to get the two mixed one with another. What we have here with chaos, with chaos is a system is bounded. There's places where it doesn't go, but it's infinitely rich in the places that it does go. So you have bounded infinities, uh, and that presents all sorts of difficulties for complexity of the situation. Um, a lot of ecologists talk about, oh, this system, I can't handle it, it's too complex. What they usually mean is it's too complicated. Complicated should not be confused with complex. Complicated is actually simple because there's no ambiguity. You don't have alternative solutions. So complicated situations are elaborate. Um, complex situations are incongruent. Uh, bits don't fit together. Complicated situations are additive. The parts add up to the whole. Whereas in complexity, the parts do not sum. Um, in complications situations, it's quite clear what you're dealing with. You know what you're dealing with. It's all there. It's all defined. Maybe elaborate and difficult to deal with, but you've got it. On the other hand, in complexity, it's ambiguous. One of the difficulties here is that complicated systems can sometimes be validly complex. But it's, so, it's very strange, and there's a level of thinking there that's going to deeply confuse most people who think about, who confuse complicated and complex. That is to say, I can't deal with this because it's so complex. In other words, what I'm dealing with is undefined because it goes beyond my range of cognition and measurement and so forth. And in that sense, that produces an ambiguity, and in that sense, an, a, a very rich, complex system, complicated system that overwhelms you has an aspect of complicated, has an aspect of complexity to it. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, com so it can be complex, but it's only very strangely so. And unfortunately, it gives my naive realists an escape hatch, which they use all the time. Um, Jevons paradox. Um, in 1800, steam engines produced one half of 1% efficiency. You hit a lump of coal, you burn it, and the torque of the engine uh, gives is about is about um, one is is 99.5 percent energy up the flue. 0.5 percent of the energy actually turns in the turns in the crane. By 1850, it was two and a half percent efficient, which doesn't seem very impressive, but it is a 500 percent improvement. Jevons uh, he publishes his book in 1866 and is very concerned that we were going to run out of coal. And the reason was he saw this exponential increase in consumption of coal. Um, you'd reckon that as steam engines get more efficient, then you would lose less energy. It takes less coal to get a given revolution of the motor. So you think, well, that should save coal, shouldn't it? Well, but it doesn't. Every time you have increased efficiency in a steam engine, it means that weavers and oil rig dr drillers and everybody else can use steam engines. And when steam engines were first used, if you didn't own a coal mine, you couldn't afford to run a steam engine. And in fact, steam engines were principally used for pumping out coal mines. But by 50 years later, uh, you could use them for winning, for s spinning and weaving and doing all sorts of other things. So the contradiction here is, on the one hand, you're increasing efficiency and that should save energy. But on the other hand, when you do that, the increased efficiency en ends up with greater consumption. The error here is that you're linking the efficiency of the steam engine, which is inside a, a bound system, to an open system, which is how much energy do you need for uh, using steam engines in general. When you mix those two together, you get Jevons paradox. Um, there's an equivalent to Jevons paradox, which is the a technology treadmill. Whoever first uses a particular technology gets huge advantage out of it and gets windfall profits. 
Because of that, goods get cheaper, whereupon the mainstream has to use the technology uh, in order to remain competitive. And in the end, uh, only the poor losers have to use, uh, have to use uh, the new technology uh, because otherwise they will simply go out of business. What that means is the technology never digs you out of a hole, it always digs you into a deeper hole. Uh, you never actually get a benefit from technology, it just means you have to work harder. So that's Jevons' paradox, and notice the two different levels of analysis. One level of analysis is the steam engine and the energy it uses. The other one is what can you use steam engines for? and therefore how much energy are you going to consume. One goes smaller, one goes bigger, it's a contradiction. It's clearly a complex situation. So Rosen, in his wonderful analysis of the van der Waals equation, at, uh, in an earlier version of this talk I laid all that stuff out with, with the PV equals RT and the van der Waals equation, and, and uh, I noticed my audience's eyes glassing over, so I'm not going to do that to you. But basically what Rosen does is to look at the gas laws, PV equals RT, and identifies a fallacy there, which is PV equals RT says you can compress a gas indefinitely. And the answer is, no, you can't, because it will liquefy. And so you need a new equation which um, involves a different version of pressure. You don't need the pressure of the box, on, on, on the box that's got the gas in it. What you want is the pressure on the particles. And there's a little term called A, a mutual attraction term, that gets into the equation and turns it nonlinear and makes it a cubic equation. Um, basically then, uh, there's two things going on in, uh, in a gas as you compress it. One of them is that there is a change of state. Uh, there is a gas in a state, you change the state, and if it was a biological system, you, the environment changes the phenotype. The A and the B and the R, which were in the equation to make the van der Waals equation, Rosen talks about them as being the genes of the gases. What he's then able to do, as he maps the uh, van der Waals equation, it's, it's a cubic equation, so uh, it, it turns into a folded pleat. That is to say, you can move across the zone away from the pleat, and the gas simply behaves. If the gas is in a state, it changes state, and in, then in this way you get what is called behavior. Which is fine until you compress it so far that you're now into the zone of that pleat. And as you get there, suddenly liquefaction occurs. That is not a change of state. That is a change in the rules of the system. That is to say, as you look at a gas, the gas particles are fairly free to move around. If it turns to a liquid, the rules on the gas particles are different. In a liquid, there's a much, great, much tighter set of restrictions. So that in this way, um, you have the distinction of behavior where two parts of before and after the behavior, uh, there, is a, there is a similarity there. As opposed to the gas is a gas and then suddenly it becomes a liquid, that is a similitude. Rosen was very clever about this. He got hold of the base of the pleat in the van der Waals equation and normalized pressure and temperature and volume in terms of the, uh, the collapse of the system with the base of the pleat. He was able to create a new, a new figure there where individual gases have this complicated and complex pleat, whereas at a higher level of analysis, gases are all simply mutants of each other. Each one has a different ABR, a system which is continuous. So, um, same thing happens with Euclidean versus non-Euclidean geometry. In Euclidean geometry, it doesn't matter where you are, Distances are measured in the same units. That's the trouble with non-Euclidean geometry, which is it depends where you are and what you're doing as to how far far is. It's very difficult. And really it's just the different levels of analysis there. And, um, and, and that makes all the difference with Einstein versus Newton. The, the difference between 
Einstein and Newton is simply a different level of analysis. You're dealing with the complexity of time and space. So the world is difficult to deal with in terms of complexity, but notice the way that I've been able to run you through a set of relatively simple examples, all of which boil down to the fact that complexity is all about change in level of analysis. That's the best way to explain complexity to naive realists. All of you people who are cyberneticists have to deal with naive realists all the time, every day. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Because there are a bunch of naive realists, um, and uh, I, I don't <laughs> like that. Would you speak to realism for a moment? To realism? It's an epistemological position, if you like, that is enormously wide, because there have been innumerable different kinds of realism. They all have in common, or at least should have in common, the notion that the picture we have of the world is in some way a representation of what is out there. It mostly brings with it the notion that truth means a good match between my picture of the world and what is out there. It's a good likeness, if you like. So that's why I say if you have understood the principle of constructivism, uh, that's out of balance. That is just not thinkable any longer. And if it's not thinkable, you realize that almost everything else you have thought before has to be modified. And that is a very difficult and in some way painful process. And I think it's, it's very, very understandable that people fight against it. about the language with which you see that determines what you see. Yes, always. So how does that come into the framework that you presented in terms of complexity and where I'm looking and so on? Well, it depends on how you look as to what you see. How you look is a level of analysis. Yes, but language is about more than that. I well, I you can translate it into those terms. I mean, it's not... No, no, I'm not sure about that. Ah. I can take one of those diagrams. And I can say, I can think of this as me seeing what's there, yeah. or I can think of this as me having a language in my head which enables me to see what I will see. That's second order. Yes. And I didn't, I didn't quite hear, maybe I missed it, how that fits within your point of view. Um, I don't know. I feel it fits. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see it. Somebody help me here. So, so do you say then that it's, it, I, I would say there are different narratives. Which are different there, when, when, when you're when you as soon as you introduce language into it, it's a different narrative. Yes. Because Which, if, you're using a, if you're using a language of mathematics or using a language of biology, the narratives are different. So let me back it up. What if you're bit. using the language of cybernetics? I claim that it's the distinctions that I know that I see. The language that I have, the distinctions, the relations, and the values with them that allow me to see certain things and disallow me from seeing other things. Yes. So again, if I'm in one of the diagrams, not moving among the diagrams, I can say either I see what's there because it's there, or I can say, second order, I see what I'm able to see because of how I'm seeing. And therefore, the challenge is for me to evolve my language to see new things or to see a new way. So this is the distinction between first and second. Am I, am I OK so far? Well, yeah. I'm having difficulty with because it's there. I Good. want to know because, it, and there. Good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so and you, you need to that. define all of those, otherwise you're dead. So you don't mean that? I don't think I'm, you seem to be put, trying to put me into a box I don't want to go. No, 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 I'm trying to <laughs> you could, no. I'm just trying simply to understand. Uh, uh, what I hear is, is I see this presentation still as realism. and. I, I do. I'm comfortably anti-realist. Well, I heard you say that, and that intrigued me initially. Yeah. However, I didn't experience, I didn't experience that in your presentation in that I had the same conflict 
not contradiction, but conflict, which means we can resolve it, hopefully, um, as, as Paul did in the sense of your language appeared to be objective, whereas what I hear Paul talking about is this idea of intersubjectivity. Of, I think I was talking about intersubjectivity, I think. I didn't but, hear it, and I don't think Paul heard it either. I didn't hear it, but I'm happy to have the, the clarification. Yeah. How was it not? Well, because in the end, it's all a matter of how you look at it. And there's lots of different things that could appear. Yeah, but what what's am I real, at? what's not real, I don't know, and so, I never can know. So let me propose an, an additional diagram. To yes, the fine. The diagrams you have are about where I'm looking. Another diagram might be the idea that what's there comes to me as opposed to a filter or a lens, these are terrible analogies. The language with which I see going out and coming back. I'm, I'm trying to make a distinction between a religion. OK, not very good. Yeah. Uh, I think what you're referring to is that the levels of analysis that you describe, um, they come across as given, but they're not um, what Paul was referring to, is that they're created. And uh, the language with which you create them Basically, you say the difference, so actually each one would afford a different language, a different way of looking. Um, then it gives you a different different way of um, but I perceiving. just want to say once more, and then I'll, I'll let it go. In each individual diagram, I can make a distinction between what I look at and how I look at it. Yes. So I'm worried that you're... Well, I'm, not sure what, I'm never sure about what I'm looking at. I just have experience. But the, but the idea is that there is something he could be looking at is still there in the language I hear. Yeah. Uh, I don't mean that. First order. Kind of thing. I mean, the, that the world has things in it, but they're not there as things. Good. The thing in this comes <laughs> from the way that we assert aspects. Beautiful. Okay? Wow. <laughs> what, whether. whether uh, something is considered complex is a choice. I choose to say that's complex or not. Complexity is often looked at as something undesirable. We want to resolve it somewhere. But complexity can be desirable, particularly when you look at these levels and the, and the, and the conflicts and contradictions that can happen, because the opportunity then is to create something new. Again, back to Heinz. Order disorder is in how I see it not in what I'm thinking I'm seeing. But you're not talking about order or disorder. You're talking about chaos. I don't agree. OK. Say it again. We'll talk later. That image of the mountains is being shown while you say what we see is what we see. It is not what is there. I know. What is there? Something like snow on the TV. And out of that, we make all sorts of structures. Some structures are possible, others are not. Out of chaos comes order. Yes, in a way, it must be a friendly chaos, because it allows us to, to construct an experiential reality that is fairly reliable. Yeah, this is my first time to trying to develop an idea of what we mean by cybernetics, because I think I've been practicing oh, cybernetics. Stuart, I'm not sure I'm very well qualified to point out what is cybernetics. Well, yeah. that's just one we don't of expect. the reasons I came here. It's because I think I've been practicing cybernetics for the rest of my life. But there's something very interesting that you're talking about that I don't know. and something that we can all disagree with. But I think that one of the problems we are having is that we don't have a true mechanism of understanding what is called a mind image plus communications. Because what happens, words are nothing more than trying to take your mind image so that you can communicate it to another person. And the problem with that is That's no matter sense. what words and language we use is not going to be the same as the mind image of the second person. Yeah. Language is nothing more to me as 
the translation of your mind image to another person. That is what to me well, lays. That's why you need narratives. Because right. tell, each person tells you what their point of view is. Right. But it's I don't agree with that premise. Image. A mind image is much different, and a lot of words that we will use will create different mind images to another person. Yeah. And that's why I love listening to you, because as you were speaking, I was able to determine my mind image trying to listen to what your mind image is through the language you're using. And I think that might be something that is, again, I, I'm very new at this, and I really apologize for sounding a little different, but no, no. It, well, made it, the it situation made it is not that me. Yeah, it made it very clear to me that language is only a translator of what you think. Mm -hmm. You cannot tell anybody what you think unless you attempt to try it. And a lot of times it's used by graphics. A lot of times it's used in particular words. And you use three or four different words so that one of these words would create the same mind image. And that's why we have a lot of arguments because a person will say something and you don't agree. But you don't agree with the person or disagree with the person, you disagree with the mind image that that word has translated to you. So I look at language as a translator. Could somebody defend language cybernetically, please? Thank you. What do you mean by a defensible metaphor? The focus is on language. The idea is that we live in metaphors. Cybernetics is the art and science of manipulating those metaphors, Nip manipulating language, manipulating life. The discourse happens in language. It seems a restricted explanation or definition of cybernetics because it's only taking place in language. But part of those metaphors that work are the formulas that make planes fly and stay, uh, keep them in the air. So, mm -hmm. what is the criteria yeah. for? No, 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 no. No, I, th I think I think we're not listening to what Larry said. When Task says metaphor, he doesn't mean metaphor in the sense of analogy. Metaphor. He means language. He means living. He means enacting through the words you use. I understand your position. However, fundamentally to cybernetics is the notions of language and that it's hmm. not transmission. I thought cybernetics was the performance of things. In other words, Where'd you get I that want idea? to do this or I want to create this. Performative ontology goes. Huh? Uh, you, you're carving it up in a particular way. You're saying there's a mind image and then there's this language thing, and et cetera. I would carve it up differently. I would okay. distribute it differently. I think it's worth a conversation and maybe a whiteboard. Um, but I think fundamentally we're in basic agreement. And I think what you're saying is not inconsistent. Uh, Jude has a way of wanting it uh, in, in a way that maybe is carving it up more distinctively. But, uh, but, but, but you're on the, you know, I would say that we're much more sympathetic. I, I, I'm not disagreeing with yeah. anyone. I yeah. just want to. Well, you say are disagreeing with me, <laughs> and that's not, that's beautiful. <laughs> Welcome to. But I, I,